Laura. Welcome to Book Lovers Corner, the uh, third Book Lovers Corner for 2022. And we're being broadcast by Waira Rapper Community Access Radio Station, Arrow FM 92.7. And this happens every fourth Tuesday of the month, 3.30 to 4.30. We're sponsored by Elmo's Books, our wonderful independent bookshop in Carterton, represented here by Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. Hello, Velda. And you can listen to our program both live online by connecting in with Arrow FM or listen later to a podcast, which you can download on your device. It also is, you can also watch it live on Wanarapa TV Freeview Channel 41 and it's available on YouTube. We'd appreciate feedback um, from, from you on the Facebook page for Arrow FM. I'm Valda Kirkwood and this is my final uh, session before I disappear from the wire wrapper down to the South Island, my Tulangawai Wai. And so the other members of the team at the moment is um, Steve, uh, is um, Gareth Rapson, and each month um, we also hear from Steve's sister Sue from Waiheke who sends us her notes from a far aisle. So welcome to our Book Lovers Corner for March. And today we're going to start off with Steve talking about uh, latest book news and books he's been reading. And um, then um, Gareth will talk about some of the books of interest to him. We'll have a music break. I'll talk about, um, look at uh, Sue's notes from a far aisle. Gareth will continue on with uh, some comments to do with books. And uh, I'll make a final contribution, and that will be our session for the day. So, over to you, Steve. Okay, well, the first thing I'd like to do, seeing as how we always run out of time at the end of the session, is (laughs) is a little something from the sponsor, Velda. Feel free to look. Oh. (laughs) It won't explode. (laughs) Totally unexpected. I I love the wrapping paper. Oh, of course. Of course, available from I get a bit of price that way. <laughs> <laughs> right. The wrapping paper is just wonderful for all my doggy friends. Because <laughs> Velda's going to get a dog when she gets to Rangiora. Well, she said. <laughs> I did not say. Oh, I love it. That's the nearest thing we've got to a Carterton souvenir. Carterton. <laughs> Uh, a Carterton tea towel, mm. which will grace my kitchen, my new kitchen down in Rangiora. Are the other bits of paper there? Yeah, and there is another bit of paper for the, um, thank you, Elmo's books, $25. I will have to come and spend that at Elmo's before There should be I two. No, that's, that's so that... Oh, two. So you feel free to um, wander into a bookshop in Rangiora and check them out. Now, I presume there is a, an independent bookshop down there. I, I don't actually know about Rangiora. I, Certainly there's one or two in Christchurch. I will find out. Yes. Yes, because there's that wonderful bookshop, Scorpios. Scorpio, and, yeah. Which I love. Mm. How nice to be handy to Scorpios. <laughs> Thank you from the sponsor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> love it. Oh, hang on. Here you go. Oh, <laughs> but wait, there's more. You can't spend that. But wait, there's more. <laughs> you could use it though. How appropriate! <laughs> a um, card with a bicycle on the front and a bookmark inside. And a bookmark. <laughs> bon voyage from the book lovers. Thanks for your work, Valda, Steve, and Gareth. Um, here's to sights unseen. <laughs> I'm ready to bike my way on un. What's going to be wonderful is off-the-road cycling and walking down in Canterbury, and I'm looking forward to that. And the um, bookmark says, my favourite thing is to go where I have never gone, <laughs> Diana, Diane Arbus. She was the photographer, wasn't she? Yeah. And I shall be doing that. Thank you. You're very welcome. I'm quite overcome. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, 
book news. Uh, if I can start by talking about Wire Up a Word, which I normally do, we keep on having to cancel things. Um, so our April uh, event with John Summers, Commercial Hotel, um, we've had to call off. Not we could have run it, mm-hmm. but I just think the way things are, I don't think anybody would come. Yeah. Um, that's because Carston is very, very quiet, isn't it? It's dead. deadly. Dead yeah. Quiet. Um, I could perhaps talk about how the business is going. Um, yes. March has been much, much better than I expected. I expected nothing. I thought everybody would just stay home, and they haven't. Well, they have to a large extent, but every now and then someone scuttles yeah. out and buys a book quickly and then disappears again. With their mask on. and yep. Yeah, so it's actually... Could have been much worse, uh, and I suspect in parts of the country it probably is. Mm. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. Every time I come to the shop, though, there's always people in there. Yeah. Yeah, there are, and it's yeah. say it's the. Um, it's been, um, you know, adequate. <laughs> right. And, and, and new, a new stock? Oh, all the time. Um, because we operate three or four months ahead. <laughs> right. So I'm getting stuff now I ordered in um, wild optimism. and then. Mm-hmm. Right, so I've got uh, plenty of books. Yeah, and I noticed uh, Lloyd-Jones' latest book was yep. there. And um, you said that's what, couple, last couple of days? Yeah, it turned up. Is that called Fish? Fish. The Fish, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll be interested to see how that rolls. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's an acquired taste. Well, yeah, different. Different, different yeah. Things differ. And that's certainly, I, I listened to a podcast, an Australian book mm. podcast last night, and they were talking about Fish Mm. And I think they were sort of um, puzzled, but mm, yeah, undecided, bemused. Because bem- I think his previous book was about refugees. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, that's right. How did yes. that go? Oh, I don't think it sold in large numbers. The thing that <coughs> confuses me is that he um, came to an event that I was at several years ago and read segments from a book which was set in Germany but kind of with a reference to Hiroshima. It's called The Beaded Curtain. But the book's never appeared. Oh. <laughs> so oh. I, but he's, he's I mean he t- apparently when he wrote Mr Pip mm. he did wrote it 11 times. He didn't just do 11 you know, 8 version and then 10 redrafts. He wrote the whole thing again and 11 didn't he, times. didn't he go to a number of publishers before he finally got a publisher? I'm not sure about that. All I know is this, if he's not happy, <laughs> you'll never see it. Yeah. No, oh, that's no, interesting. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, just talking about uh, why word again very briefly, mm. um, although we've cancelled everything, uh, the Kappa Carterton, which is a group in Carterton have uh, decided to rerun our December event, which is a Wairapa Kororo with Ra Smith and Gareth Winter. And um, they're doing that so that can be recorded. So they're running that again this Sunday afternoon in the library. Yes, I noticed that. I got the email about that mm. and I missed it last year. Mm. So I'm quite excited, but I must go in and book. You've got to book in. So yeah, cause presumably it's because they know that. Have the numbers. Well, the most they can fit in there is 20, so... Get in fast. Yeah. Um, so that, that is coming up this Sunday, which is fairly short notice, mm. but you know, seemed like a good idea. Um, I can keep on talking about Remember Me by Charity Norman because you're curious to see how it would go. It's uh, the best-selling work of fiction in independent bookshops in New Zealand last week. Um, so... Pretty well. Does right. that mean she's on the Ockham list? That will be for next year. Oh, right. Potentially. Okay. And I, would, yeah. I don't know what the rules are. It's a New Zealand book. This was yeah. published by Ellen and Unwin. Oh. But she's a New Zealand writer. So what, yes, do you, we don't know what I the presume, rules are for that. I presume it will count, mm. even if it's not, strictly mm. speaking, a New Zealand publisher. Mm. Although they've got a New Zealand publishing arm. Mm. So we'll see. 
But hey, your comments, since it, well, the Occam's were mentioned, um, I, we've got having the short list here of for fiction, I noticed that like um, Loop Tracks and She's a Killer mm. – didn't get into that and, final four, and and we rated those books. And I I quite shocked that loop loop tracks didn't get on, got yeah. get in. I mean, we got a good winter, entanglement, Greta and Valden, and Kuragatuku mm. um, were shortlisted. Any your feelings about that? <laughs> the only one that has sold in any. Volume is Greta and Valden or Valdine, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, and that's only just started to work in the last week or three, really, mm. last few weeks. So that and that may well be because of the Ockham Public City. Yeah. But so what, how do, how's loop loop tracks sold? Pretty well. So th- what what's your thoughts about it not being on the shortlist? Oh, well, I suppose if I wanted to have any influence, I'd put my hand up and yeah. Get involved, which I don't, so I'm not pre- mm. really prepared to stand mm. on the sidelines and yeah. winch. But yeah, um. well, hey, maybe switching just to the general non-fiction, mm. um, the short list of from the from the centre are writers like Life by Patricia Grace, The Alarmist, Fifty Years of Measuring Climate Change, The Mirror Book by Charlotte Grimshaw, and Voices from New Zealand Wars. Um, thoughts on those four? That, well, I'm happy enough with those. The climate change book we've had no real exposure to or done anything with. The other mm. three have all done well, and the other are all. Yeah, I know you you have some views on. Well, I know yeah. it's down here the very last line of this of the listener analysis of the long list. Mm. They pick um, this is Mark Broarch. He picks um, the Mirror Book by Charlotte Grimshaw to win mm. the Ockham. How, let's go around the group. Velda, what do you think? I I I didn't like it. Um, I thought I thought it was like a dance of the seven vows, exposing you know intimate family stuff, which mm. of course, and it's like paying back the father for revealing intimate family stuff. So it, to me. It looked like an internecine, isn't that a family thing? Internecine yes. sort of thing happening, mm. and and um, they are the first family of New Zealand literature now. Um, well, yeah, and I just had concerns about that. I felt very uncomfortable yeah. with it, and there were things within it about her growing up. Um, when you live near the coast and near water, you know, allowing children to go off and explore un, unsupervised. Mm. Um, I, there was a lot of concerns I had about it. Didn't work for you. What about you? It didn't work for me. Um, well, I think it's quite... Because Charlotte's been a successful novelist. Yep. Yeah. And I love all her. And of course I love her other some. work, yeah. Yeah. Major man of letters. CK, yeah. Oh, so I guess it's um it's an important book in the New Zealand um, um, pa- Pantheon. pantheon. Of, of, yeah, I haven't read it. I've held it in my hand yeah. and it didn't talk to me like, you know, read this book. And and I'd heard you know, I was going like, do I really want to plunge into the this family situation? And even though she's probably very, you know, will do it very well. And I am enjoying her recent columns in The Listener. I mean, they're engaging and... But it's... Um, and it's one of those things, if she wins, I'll probably read it <laughs> to see what all the fuss is about. And if she doesn't, I just may keep her at arm's length. Yeah, it's... it's but I, I take your point, Steve, that given the whole pantheon of the, the stead Grimshaw... Enclave, mm. then it it is important, but as you know, um, um, yeah, I, 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 and that happens pretty soon, doesn't it? The, yeah. the, the announcements is it next month or? Oh, it'll be a little while, I think. Okay. Yeah. Hey, and it's a big. It's our biggest award, so it, it's it's no doubt, it's it's in the wind, and it's exciting to mm. to see. You know, book prizes are, are always good fun, and they're always. Things to argue about, which I guess yeah. is half the point. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Certainly the bookers. Like we're saying about, you know, loop tracks. Mm. Yep. Mm. Um, okay, talking about books I've been reading, the book I've brought along is called Red Notice, which is actually quite an old book, originally published in 2015. I just... Um, I've been quite, um, well, engrossed, absorbed, horrified by the war in Ukraine. Um, as, as we all are. Yeah, and I heard Claire Delore on the radio last night saying this, is, this may be the biggest event of her life, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking back on my nearly 70 years on this planet, thinking probably mine too. Depending on what happens yep. next. Yep. I mean, if they have some peace talks today and everybody just packs up their gun and goes home, then it might fade from the memory. But oh, if. I can't see that happening. No, it doesn't seem to be the Russian way. No. So we might find that Mariupol is this century's Stalingrad. Um, siege of Leningrad went on for nearly three years. Yep. Uh, so. It, in that sense, this Red Notice is a book by a guy called Bill Browder, who crops up on TV quite a bit lately, uh, and it's it's the best way to understand Putin's Russia. Bill Browder is he's a bright guy. One of his claims to fame was that his grandfather ran for president of the United States for the Communist Party which created a few problems for their family for a generation or two after oh, that. Oh, would, yes. So once the McCarthy years cropped up yeah. and things. Um, but he, um, he, he, rather than, well, everybody else in his family is a scientist, he decided not to do that. Uh, and he, in a desperate attempt to make his way in the financial world, which is what he was trying to do, he got involved with Russia um, after the the collapse, if you like, of the Soviet Union when they were trying to figure out what to do with all the stuff that the state owned. Because you can't... The state owns everything. Actually, transitioning the ownership is not a simple thing. So the only job commission he could get was uh, advising the owners or the of the Murmansk fishing fleet. So he went off to Murmansk, which in itself was not an easy thing to do. Um... And they wandered up and down a, quite a big trawler. And I'll just read this a little bit. Tell me, Mr. Prutkoff, how much does one of those boats cost? I asked. Irene is still translating. We got them for $20 million new out of a shipyard in East Germany, he answered. How many do you have? About 100. And how old are they? Seven years on average. I did the maths. 100 trawlers at $20 million each meant that they had $2 billion worth of ships. I figured out if the fleet was seven years old and it was about half depreciated, meaning that they had $1 billion of ships at the current market value. I was amazed. These people had hired me to advise them on whether they should exercise their right under the Russian privatisation programme to purchase 51% of the fleet for $2.5 million. $2.5 million? For half a stake and over a billion dollars worth of ships? Of course they should. It was a no-brainer couldn't understand why they needed anyone to tell them this. More than anything, I wish I could have joined them in buying the 51%. So that's when he figured out what was going on all over Russia. And he then went back to the States and managed to cajole some money and put together a fund to buy these incredibly cheap assets. Most of those assets finished up in the hands of relatively few people. The oligarchs. The oligarchs. So that's where the Russian kleptocracy came from. Now I love that kleptocracy. That's yeah. That's the word of the day. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Um, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, CEO of Yukos and Russia's richest man, had been arrested. I was run, running on my treadmill in my apartment watching CNN breaking news. And then he goes on to say that Khodorkovsky um, had fallen out with Putin because he'd got involved in Russian politics. Khodor Putin at that stage was president of the United of of Russia and had been for, since two thousand. And 
he said Putin not just arresting him, but he did something which was unprecedented. He televised the trial and allowed television cameras in the courtroom to fill Russia's richest man as he sat silently in the courtroom cage. And then he says, after Khodorkovsky was found guilty, most of Russia's oligarchs went one by one to Putin and said, Vladimir Vladimirovich, what can I do to make sure I won't end up sitting in a cage? I wasn't there. I'm only speculating, but I imagine Putin's response was something like this, 50%. Not 50% to the government, but 50% to the presidential administration, Mm. but 50% to Vladimir Putin. Mm. I don't know this for sure. It could have been 30%. 70%. Or 70%. What I know for sure was that after Khodorkovsky's conviction, my interests in Putin's were no longer aligned. And by many estimates, he became the richest man in the world. So that, that's kind of the, the background to the oligarchs and to Putin's power and to the way Russia changed. The, the rest of this book, which is a great read, I mean, it, it, and it sounds was published when 2015. Right. Um, the rest of the books kind of reads like a thriller because it leads on to the Magnitsky Act, which was an act uh, passed in the U.S. Senate and in the House and in the European Parliament, which sanctioned a number of um, prominent Russians, not including Putin, I don't think. Um, and it's named after Sergei Magnitsky, who was Bill Browder's tax accountant, who got involved in a complicated scandal and was arrested and beaten to death. In the United States? No, in, in Russia. In Russia. Yeah, no one was ever charged, yeah. understandably, I guess. Yeah. Red Notice is, is actually nothing to do with the Soviet Union. It's actually something that uh, any member of Interpol, which includes Russia can post, meaning that anybody subject to a red notice would be arrested passing through any airport, and Bill Browder is subject to a red notice. Really? Mm. So he's hiding away somewhere? No, no, oh no. Not now. Yeah, not now. Not now. I I remember you recommending this book back in the day and and reading it. It is a fantastic read. Yeah. And you're right about it being like a thriller. Yeah. It is absolutely a page turner. Mm. Um. You're right, and it gives a context to to Putin, um, but just in its in its own way, it is a engaging story on all sorts of levels. Yeah, um, yeah it's and people still buy it. I mean, you'd be such a big fan for it. I imagine you. Yeah, well, I've, we've sold a lot over the years, and we're selling it again now. Um, you know, I think you said to me before, is anybody? St- publishing anything about what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. Well, it's happening a bit fast. Mm. Um, this is the nearest thing I've got, which gives a bit of background. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Steve. Really interesting. Mm. I'll add that to my reading list for when I enrol at the Rangiora Library. <laughs> Thank you. Should. you. Now, um, I think that, Gareth, okay. have you got... Let's start off with my first book. Um, here it is. It's called The Anomaly by Herb Lee Tellier. Um, I'm sure that's Hervé. Hervé. Hervé Lee Tellier. Yeah, they'll go. Now, you give me that. Um, who who is in, in, lives in Paris and a writer, and he's head of a, a little group called um, who write in speculative fiction. So um, this is a book about... An anomaly, an anomaly, which is what, guys? What is an well, I odd? Always, I always thought it was something that didn't fit. Yeah, an odd, exactly. oddness. It's, it's something yeah. that doesn't Oddity. fit. And so that's in the heart of this. And, and it, this this book, international bestseller in Europe, like one and a half million sold already, uh, winner of the major French literary prize in 2020. Um, Got a feeling it was on the international bookers long list, but didn't win. Mm. Um, and I think I think it's a really really good book, and and um, I'm going to give it quite a hard pitch, saying you know up there with Red Notice that this is um, a really entertaining read. Um, it begins with with 
are like a hundred pages of introducing us to eight characters. Um, a hitman, a writer, a film editor, an architect, uh, a musician, a six-year-old, and a lawyer. And each chapter is written in a different filmmaking or television script or novelistic way. So it is clever, and each one is interesting. Um, as And so we are hooked on all these characters and what is happening to them um, in their lives. And like in the Hitman one, um, there's a comment there that Hitmen owe an awful lot to Hollywood scriptwriters, <laughs> and you know, which is kind of like a little clue for kind of what's happening. And so we get this hundred pages, and then we get the sort of conceptual incident where this plane, Air France 006 from Paris to New York, hits a lot of turbulence, a huge storm, emerges um, from this the storm and makes contact for their landing but is redirected off to a secret military base. Um, and why is it? Because an identical flight has arrived three months ago <laughs> with all these people on it and had arrived and landed and here they are again. And this is the anomaly. And they've, they're checking it, everything about the pilot and asking questions and suddenly we've got an, an anomaly. What is this? And so the plane lands and the American authorities are scrambling. Um, they're getting experts together to say what has happened, what, how are we going? And so we get, um, we get this sort of mix of experts. You'd cast Jeff Goldblum, you know, as one oh, of yes. the, he'd be right in the thick of this. Now, it's not the Matrix where machines are kind of, um, uh, you know, the world is run by machines and they're using humans as energy sources. No, this is, instead we have a kind of a, a theory that the, the brains trust that who are thinking about it, going, is this, a, is this a program on a, of a vast simulation of, by an alien civilization of an unimaginable um, sort of uh, tech capability running um, our lives and so we get and now you've got the situation and the guy's going is this a test that this thing has arrived with all these people now the people are divided up into March um, you know March the March crew and the June crew and now they're going to confront all these people who've landed with their doppelganger um, and they've got issues They've got problems, and they bring in the religious people who, who are absolutely, you know, and the scientists. Who, everybody's struggling trying to explain it, and the intelligence community and um, the military. Everybody's involved. Everybody's trying to work it out. And um, hilarious, funny, playful kind of conversations and working it. How are the characters going to react? Now, how would you react to meeting yourself? Don't know, and and of course no the idea. problems are suddenly your families have two of you, <laughs> and um, it's kind of like the and the legal complexities of all this and what is going to how it all going to play out. Um, these some people are you going to share life with this person? Are you, you know some are people going to disappear? Say look, I'll oh, just give me another identity. I'll become. Um, it is. It is, it is great speculative work, and it's cleverly done um, in, a, in sort of like a, in lots and lots of different levels. I can see why this book's a hit. It absolutely, you are sitting there smiling away as, as the world grapples with it. Um, there's a great sort of ludic ending. What's that mean? I guess it would be kind of like slightly ludicrous. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. It's yeah. sort of happening at the end, but... Um, and it goes, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like it's the great god Netflix, um, the way to interpret the world. You know, it's kind of like, and it's from television, this idea has kind of emerged. And the film rights have been bought for the movie, and it shall arise on our TV screens, this whole sort of story. Um, so how, do you think he, he just thought it was a clever idea and then tried to had to work out how to resolve it? Or do you think he had the end in mind? I don't know. Sometimes there, I read books and the thinking it. 
That didn't know how to finish this. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, he's got a great finish. Okay. The finish, it, it, it's kind of like, and, you know, there's, because of the quality of the writing and each individual, each situation writes, looks like a, a kind of like a TV sort of story, you know, that script writers would come up. And the idea of a, this, you know, each century takes a second on the simulation. It's just they're running this stuff, this, this simulation that we're all living is just going at an incredible rate, and then they're trying things again, and it is makes us think about how, what our lives are and how what it all means. Um, which which is what COVID is doing very much at the moment too. Yeah, and it's like the great mystery of humanity. It is, and it gets stuck into the you know like Frenchmen to do into into religious thinking and thought. Um, and and very philosophical. The French are yeah. very philosophical. So existential thriller. Yeah, you know it really is. Um, and, and terrifically speculative, and it's not it's it's not sci-fi because it just deals with our times so beautifully and presents a really clever idea. Um, give it a shot. Totally, you know, good to go. Brilliant, thanks, Gareth. And I think at that stage, it is time for our music. <laughs>
Welcome back to Book Lovers Corner, Arrow FM, uh, 90, uh, Arrow FM 94, uh, 92.7. That uh, song, which was Leaving for California uh, from, uh, to celebrate um, since Pat's Day last week. And um, I thought Leaving for California is appropriate for me leaving the wire wrapper. So Rangi Ora is the... Rangi Ora is the... the Absolutely. We'll see. Mm. <laughs> well, you won't see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now we will um, uh, have a look at Sue's notes from a far aisle for this month. And last month she talked very, very positively about the public library because finally she got access to it and how integrated the public library system of Auckland was. But she's had her nose put severely out of joint with the recent, um, what she calls the petty Covidian bureaucracy that demands all sorts of signing and passing, pass scanning and verification. And she said, I have shown all this paperwork repeatedly, but my confrontation with the person at the door last time I went was the last straw. So just to teach them a lesson, I have not been back as yet. Nose, spite, face. Yes. Well, they you, you could not actually happy, connect those. She's not a happy chappy. Hey, this is my theory. So these times have made us all a little bit more grumpy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so and this is a perfect manifestation of that. Mm. Yeah. Okay, sorry, continue. And I mean, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I've been doing the same at my library, but I still have managed to... Hang in there. Um, so they're also nice there. Yeah, that's well, true. That's, that's true. They're kind of but I do miss them. some of the old ones at Carterton Library, like mm. Quinton and Andrea and, yeah, you know, and, and so on. Um, but never mind, the new ones are also lovely. Um, so Sue has then fallen back on, as she did during the lockdowns, onto her own bookshelf and onto the bookshelf, I gather too, Steve, you said, of her son's. Yes. On Waiheke, because you had sold him the books, so you knew. <laughs> um, and also the, um, and this cannot be underestimated in these days, is the library's e-book service. And I think that they, they're really important. Um, it's an important strategy. I've used them when I've been travelling um, and found that absolutely invaluable, travelling. Um, I haven't resorted to it yet um, while I've been you know, based at home. Uh, she was interested in the um, posting by Ellen and Unwin on Facebook which questioned why the leadership of New Zealand is so low. Steve, you, have you... See, I, I don't necessarily think that that's right mm -hmm. um, in terms of what we sell, what yeah. people come and ask us for. It may, it may be that um, the, the large online retailers um, sell large chunks of uh, imported fiction, but and that might distort the, the yep. kind of the mix. But you know, we do pretty well with New Zealand fiction. Um, Sue says here that. One view that it's too dark to appeal to a mass audience. Well, I don't think so. Um, we are a bit introspective, but there's been some quite good stuff written, and some of it stands up pretty well. What would you take a dark thing and you look at Owie and Pomeray's books? You know, they're kind of. I'm trying to think of who else. Um, no, they, they well, crime fiction is yeah, crime, crime fiction is always crime. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's and it's always popular. But um, and and looking at our long list, that's a bit of a variety. There's not too much dark stuff in that. Mm. Those dark thrillers don't make don't get through, do they? Not the thrillers, no. 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 And I and, and I I enjoy reading New Zealand fiction. Mm. So we do dark anyway. We are a bit of a gloomy lot. Yes. Uh, well, there was, was it Sam Neill's about the cinema of unease, wasn't it? Which is about the darkness of New Zealand cinema. Yeah. 
Well, I think Vincent Ward's got a lot to answer for. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but then there's, that's not necessarily true either. I mean, goodbye pork pie, that was fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, there's lots of exceptions in the argument. But what, how, what else did she have to tell um, us? So she said, to their credit, and that's Ellen and Unwin, they're offering financial support to improve the situation. Mm. Um, one view is that New Zealand fiction is too dark to appeal to mass audience, which is what we've been talking about. Maybe. And intriguingly, what Sue has said, I don't read much New Zealand fiction myself. Mm. And she, because she's very much a history and more international fiction, isn't it? Um, she said, I prefer to consider the actions and thoughts of characters and events set somewhere else more interesting than my own backyard. Now, I wonder if that is shared by other people. I, um, that, in my experience, I don't think so. But no. Well, I've been thinking about this a little bit, and, and I guess if you look at New Zealand, we're mm. four million people out of eight billion or something. And so there's another 7.9 whatever million people out there mm. who... So the chances of all of the best writers being here is mm. kind of, you know, <laughs> arithmetic tells you that's yeah. unlikely. Yeah. So most of the best books in the world will be written somewhere yeah. else. But some of the ones that speak mostly to us, mm. not exclusively, but have to mm. be related to our own landscapes mm. and history mm. and things. Mm. Yeah. And we can have strange sort of blind spots. I mean, I, I'm, I'm well aware that I'm, I'm not a big fan of Australian fiction. Mm. And so, and I love European fiction. So that works, you know. But I do like my New Zealand stuff. I do love the, it's the context we understand and we're comfortable with. Um, and I'll always be in it. But those Aussies... But, uh, but, but there again, I love Aussie fiction, but because right. I've spent a number of years living there, maybe that's why. There's a lot of Aussie writers who are writing, you know, about London or Paris, you know, but, you know, Tom Keneally, you know, mm. Peter Carey, um, yeah, they're, 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 and very well-credentialed people. They, they do have some stuff, but... <laughs> yeah, they're annoying. Yeah. Anyway, go. Well, anyway... So the sort of uh, series that, as Sue does get immersed in series, so she says, this, hot, this month of hot sunny days has drifted by as I've been rereading some of my favourites. And one series I've been enjoying afresh are the Grant Chester books by James Runcie. He's the son of Robert Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who married Charles and Di. The main character is Sidney Chambers, vicar of Grantchester, which is a beautiful village a couple of miles from Cambridge. And I can remember having in the orchard a cup of cup of tea, afternoon tea in the orchard at Grantchester. Correct. And the, I think, um, you know, uh, what was it Rupert Brooke did about the clock chiming? <coughs> and that was... I just thought he was a foreign tip. field man, but... Yeah, was a, sorry, go on, yep. Oh, excuse me. And we far enough away. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a um, part-time detective and supporter and drinking companion of the local detective inspector, um, Geordie Keating. So plenty of crime happens, a bit like Midsummer Murders, but these are solved at a leisurely pace and amid discussions of music and moral and historic religious matters and are set in the 1950s and 60s and at a time not exactly historic to Sue, nor us, actually. <laughs> um, <coughs> they remind me a bit of Inspector Dalgleish series by Ruth Rendell. He also had an up a religious upbringing and a thoughtful and considered approach to solving crime, though Rendell's crimes had a darker edge to them than the often quite humorous situations that arise in Grantchester. Well, I've actually seen the TV series mm. of this and, and enjoyed them. So I can imagine rereading the series would be, um, you know, a really nice way of passing the time. So um, that's... The rest about me culling my books will come to 
um, after Gareth's next contribution. Next book is a little next is a little wee tiny book, um, How to See by Tik Nahan. Now, the I had to go to YouTube to study how to say his name, um, but he he's a Vietnamese Zen Buddhist monk who who died um, at the age of ninety five last month, um, born and died in, in Vietnam. Because he didn't die, did he? Well. No, well, uh, he did, but he he may be back with us. Yes. The um, anyway, and he had there were tributes um, from. I imagine he's been reincarnated. Something. Oh, good. okay, of course. Yes. Yeah. Of course. You know, there, there have been worldwide tributes from um, psychology leaders and religious leaders and um, social justice leaders, and he he's a man who lived a remarkable life. Um, but it, he's known for being like the father of mindfulness. Now, which is no doubt in our life, and um, which and the, and the idea of engaged Buddhism, and um, I've always subjects which I enjoy, I enjoy reading about. So I've always been, I have read him throughout his life, um, well, throughout my life, and and enjoyed them. And this little slight book is part of a series like how to sit, how to fight, how to walk, um, all with you know nice sort of gentle messages um i liked him when he, he went and spoke at the google headquarters and he said the problem with the world is that there's too much information and you guys are the problem <laughs> we are drowning we're being overwhelmed with information um but you know in 1975 coining that idea of, of mindfulness um and a, and a guardian article said nice little bit of research they said there are now 60,000 books in the amazon book list with the tide word mindfulness in the title what so so he's got a lot to answer for yeah he has <laughs> and it is you know and we you know and it's kind of like it's a thing that everybody thinks and talks and aspires about um to do not easy to stay undistracted and quiet and calm um i, I thought he was a great um you know sort of writer of of um books about um compassion Right at the heart of it all was actually um, trying to understand your life in a compassionate way. And I thought, you know, what a great message. So um, regret his passing, um, acknowledge his books. And you've got a sort of philosophy section. Oh, yeah. How does that go, that section go? Oh, very well. There's a, a, a core pick group of oh, people. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, don't, I, I never know kind of when... Philosophy morphs into mindfulness, mm. morphs into self-help, morphs into spirituality, spirituality or morphs into um, psychological health, yeah. everything. Mm. I never know where to put things, and consequently when someone says, have you got a copy of, and I say yes, but I don't know where the hell to find it. Mm. It could be one and a half a dozen different places. In I know you've shop. got a couple of really interesting shelves on it, which I always glance over, <coughs> and there's lots of intriguing titles. Um, mm. And there is an audience for that. Those right, they oh, there is, um, you know. Think uh, I don't know how things fit together, as I say, but things like Eckhart Tolle and the Power of Now. Yeah, um, mm. you think the Vancouver writer, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, those things sell all the time. Yeah. So what what year was that published? Oh, this Gareth? one was pu probably. Let's have a quick look. Um, let's see, two thousand and nineteen. Mm. So well, well that's quite la late for something on mindfulness. Yeah, and he was ill for the last part of his life, you know, in, for several years, and didn't really speak an awful lot, but did write. Um, you know, and it was, I encourage people to say, you know, just have a look. If you were looking for a, a, a person in a study of compassion, you look no further than, than mm. this guy. He was, um, you know, I think acknowledged as one of the... Uh, Told in about 5,000 words or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not a huge investment. Of and... And I mean, I was trying to think when I first came across mindfulness, which was back um, when my sister was in uh, Buller Hospital uh, with cancer, and the our doctor came in, and he acknowledged me, which was very unusual. It's very unusual for doctors when they come into a room to actually acknowledge somebody visiting, and wanted to know about the relationship that I had. You know, and 
who was I relative to my sister and and um, and he talked about he you know he was trying to practice mindfulness in the hospital and he then later that week talked to my sister and her husband for an hour and a half mm. focusing on who they were what you know where they were at all, all sorts of things which is very unusual in a hospital situation and I had, probably got the sack because I had it could well have I had four years of 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 you know being in different hospitals with her and that was the only time where I was acknowledged my mm. presence was acknowledged and he talked about mindfulness and that was the first time so this would have been about 2012 2013 uh, so that's very interesting to oh, I mean now, and then you can have your Fitbit can Give you little reminders to you know be be Slow more down. You're going too fast. You know, well, just like fast. hey, wake up and not be you know caught up in your own thoughts all the time. Um, and you know, looking for love and feeling groovy. See, it's you find oh, it everywhere. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of like he was the the bridge between you know psychology and um, modern healthcare mm. and kind of ancient wisdoms and practices and found an audience that were kind of attuned to that. So, you know, all power to him. And, um, you know, it's one of those, I think, we one of those significant people in, in our lifetime, I, I like to and, think. And still worth a read to mm. look, look him up. Mm. And a quick final one for me, a um, little book by Pamela Paul, um, who's the New York Times book reviewing editor, um, called 100 Things We've Lost to the Internet. And this is just a fun, some, I think someone opened, she opened a file and just said, listen, we used to have these sort of ingrained habits, this, these sort of um, cherished ideas, beloved objects, uh, stubborn preferences. And then the internet came along and changed all that. And she's kind of documented in a, in a very fun, amusing way of pre-internet days and now, um, you know, how things happen. And light, bit of fun, um, and you'll find yourself chuckling away about how things used to be. And very thought-provoking, I would have thought. Some oh, examples? The phone in the kitchen. Still got it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, how we all used to be like there, and you you know, don't speak too long, you know, uh, this sort of thing. Um, kind of like bad photos. You know, we used to take bad photos. Mm. Now we just delete all the bad stuff. But, you know, we used to have, you know, and filing. We used to file things, yes, you know. still and, do. I, um, obviously, I'm... <laughs> you know, they forgot my birthday. Nobody forgets the birthday now. You get little dings and sort of stuff <laughs> like that. Um, birthday cards, which we used to send. Now you can create stuff. You know, and it just yeah, yeah, I think, you know, goes sell, on. We sell a lot of birthday cards. Yeah. Some, some of us still... Yeah. Have a lot of that in our lives. Family meals were different back in the day. Um, yeah, trying to try and not let that happen. Relying on the doctor back, you know, back in the day. Oh, that's we, that's good. What, what, doctor? Yeah. what, what yeah, doctor? That's right. It used to be. Now we we do it all. We look online and do our own checks and then go to get it validated. But anyway, the um, yep. fun book just goes on and on, and lots of things that you'll enjoy. And so to finish off in the last five minutes or so, uh, the final bit about from uh, Sue's notes was, I can sympathise with Valda having to cull her collection of books to meet the challenges of downsizing. My advice would be to collect collections of favourite fiction writers because these are the ones you will continue to reread, as she has in fact been doing herself. Some non-fiction books unfortunately get outdated and need to go, but you know the, the useful and interesting ones that you can't bear to part with. Finally, be prepared for a second cull when you're setting up in your new house. Obviously, that's what Sue did. Mm. I still, I'm still coming across books that I can no longer see the sense in keeping. And so on our um, drive here... Uh, Gareth was asking me, you know, what books have I kept? And so ones I've kept is, for example, H for Hawk by Helen MacDonald, Hair with the Amber Eyes by Edmund Val, All My Lonely Planet Travel Books, 
Um, really? Really? Yeah, that's kind of... <laughs> really? I can buy new ones at um, Elmo's. Well, you might have to, because whatever it said, probably isn't there anymore. But I'm going. I'm doing for memory's sake. I can go back. Oh, okay. Oh, Aide de, de mon moi. Aide de mon moi. Uh, memoir. Um, I've also kept a couple of Peter McIntyre, New Zealand artist, yes. um, Kākahi and Wellington, because they inside they I have been both to Kākahi with his wife after Peter died. I lived next door to Patty McIntyre. In Kākahi? Uh, but we went up to Kākahi oh, okay, for yeah. a holiday, but no, left, lived next door to her in Vogeltown. Because that's Debbie Dittmer country, you know that. That's right. <laughs> And so, and they're personally signed um, by Patty. Yeah. And, and well, become, that, that's beyond a book, isn't it? That's a. It's absolutely, and and so you keep book, some books because they are beyond being just books. Yeah. Um, I, of course, as you know, um, love Peter Wallaben's um, "The Secret Life of Trees." I love Lunig, who's a Melbourne. Um, uh, cartoonist, love his work. I gifted most of my Looney books to friends who were up from Christchurch and over from Palmerston North during the weekend, but I kept his long uh, journey to happiness, which I just love. Uh, He's got a duck and everything, isn't he? It's, yes, I love his duck. And teapots. <laughs> so... Um, you know, so there are, there is a number that I've kept. And books? Well, I have to say I took had great angst about do I keep my Edmunds cookbook? Well, it's not going to take up much room. And so I have, yes. falling to bits as it is. And also the cookbook that I had when I did home economic, no, domestic science <laughs> in the third and fourth form at Buller Tech. Perfect. Westport Tech. So I, <laughs> there's some I have kept for sentimental reasons. And um, so thank you all for um, um, allowing me to share your uh, listening time, your viewing time for the last several years. And um, well, with a, before I say goodbye, we'll just quickly go through... Uh, Steve, your book for today? Oh, I talked about Red Notice by Bill Browder um, mm. because it's a great read, but also because I think it's currently important. And Gareth? A French book, The Anomaly, uh, a little book from Thich Nhat Hanh on how to see, and a hundred things that we've lost to the internet. Well, thank you all, and um, goodbye from Arrow FM 92.7 in Masterton and the Wairarapa, from Gareth and from Steve. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.